Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, here's your host, Jason Day. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Jason Day, and I had an incredible and important conversation this week with Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. Brenda is a dynamic speaker, author, professor, and thought leader with over 30 years of experience in the Ministry of Reconciliation. She earned a Master of Divinity from Fuller Theological Seminary and a Doctorate of Ministry from Palmer Theological Seminary. Brenda is an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Covenant Church and serves on the pastoral staff at Quest Church in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Brenda is an associate professor at Seattle Pacific University, where she directs the Reconciliation Studies Program. Previously, she was on staff with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship for 14 years. She has written a number of important books, including The Heart to Racial Justice, Roadmap to Reconciliation, and her latest, which is releasing soon, entitled Becoming Brave, Finding the Courage to Pursue Racial Justice Now. On this week's episode, Brenda and I discuss recent issues and the hard work of racial reconciliation that both honors God and honors others. Brenda speaks about the need to recognize white dominant culture and why that impacts how we address reconciliation. She explains why reconciliation must come from being rooted in scripture and in the life of Jesus and how we can focus on repairing broken systems together for true and lasting change. This is a conversation you will definitely want to share with your entire ministry team. It's so very important. Now, please, won't you join me in my conversation with Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. Brenda, it is such a blessing to have you with us on the Church Leaders Podcast. Welcome. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you. Brenda, um, before we dive right in, I I just want to say that um, I'm so thankful for your voice in the church. Um, I'm thankful from the position of, of a minister in the church, but I'm thankful personally as a father. Um, I have six children. Um, my kids are adolescents now and young adults. My oldest just recently turned 23. And um, they're kids that have great hearts and uh, love Jesus and uh, care about our world and the events that have transpired over the last um, uh, several weeks and have really, really impacted them. And they have a lot of questions, and they're seeking how they can step into these racial injustices, how they can step into reconciliation. And you know, Brenda, there's so many voices out there, and and this is one of the conversations I've had with them over and over again, um, because there's so many voices, you know, through social media. That's where they see most things, right? And and hear most things. And and I've really tried to say, guys, um, there are a lot of people saying good things, but but. My heart as a dad is that you'd focus on kingdom people who are saying good things. And I've shared, Brent, I've shared everything that you've written. I, you know, I pointed them to you. They're following you on Instagram now. I mean, I've, I've really, um, I've really tried to point them to to you, Brenda, and and some of your colleagues because you're speaking um, from the perspective of people who are following Jesus Christ. And, and my concern has been that, that my kids might get swept up into some other rhetoric, which might sound good on the surface level, but it doesn't go to the heart uh, of the matter, um, like what, what you and, and many of your colleagues who are devoted Christ followers do. And so from a personal perspective, as a dad, I just want to thank you for your ministry and for your voice. Well, I thank you for that. That is a super high compliment because I too have two children and they are young adults and they too are um, the most important thing to me. It's nothing that I do publicly that matters more than my family. And those two are the best things that have ever um, Mm. come through this life. No book I've written or anything else I've done are better than those two. So with that being said, I share, um, both your pride in this generation coming behind us, these young people who know that they're inheriting a world that's different than the one we grew up in. And they're not debating stuff that older people are debating. They know this is a multicultural world. They know that it's global. They know that injustice exists. They get it, they see it. They just don't know quite how to respond, but they want to respond. And that gives me hope. So I too am watching my children. I too want it fueled and rooted in a sense of their commitment to a kingdom Mm. that um, 
God has called us to be representatives of in the earth. And that's why I get so hurt when I see the church not embrace the call of God that we have, because I believe that we're the hope of the world right. and we've got to take our place to do it. So anyway, I'm trying to disciple my two also because they are actively involved in raising their voices. And I'm glad that they are. I'm proud of it. Amen. Amen. Well, Brenda, um, you have a, a new book that is releasing um, really soon here entitled Becoming Brave. And you and I were talking just a little bit about, um, you know, who knew other than God? Um, what what we'd be in the midst of right now as this book is releasing and uh th this book is um you know is you speaking to the church about um racial reconciliation and that's something that you've been doing for quite some time and yet uh this book is is a bit different in a way um it seems that you have approached things from a different uh, different perspective in some ways, it seems that um, you've learned over the years, right? Um, things that have been effective and maybe some things that, that you'd hoped to have been effective but had not been quite as effective. And one of the things in the book you write, I just want to share this with you. You say, I'll no longer preach, teach, or lead reconciliation on white dominant culture's terms. And I, I would love for you to help us understand um, what it looks like to lead reconciliation on white dominant culture's terms and why this, this shift that you've experienced? Well, <laughs> um, I remember the day, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember the day I wrote that and I remember um, what prompted uh, my reflection. Someone who I don't know on social media, white male, at the, from the picture looked to be middle, middle age, said to me, and I quote, we like you better when you just quoted Bible verses, mm. unquote. And it hurt, it stung, um, but it suggested something to me, that as long as I stayed um, in the box that kept white dominant culture evangelical Christians feeling okay with me, that I was prophetic enough, but not too much, that I didn't raise issues that were um, social or perceived as political. So I just uh, tried to stay in the Bible. I tried sincerely. I had no hidden agenda. I had no extra motive. And so I thought that if I would just talk from the Bible, that I could convince Christian leaders, those who came to hear me speak in the various places that God provided for me to do so, that they would hear me having a rigorous theological, um, compelling call to the church uh, that, would, that would rally us, that would really literally cause us to kind of go, this is the call of God on us. But what I realized was as long as I talked about the Bible, but didn't bring in any of the other things that demonstrated what the Bible was related to, people liked me. And that guy was basically summing it up. You speak on our terms and we'll tell you what the terms of engagement are. And if you deviate from that, we don't like you anymore. And uh, it made me angry. It hurt. I deleted him from my Facebook page, amen. And because uh, <laughs> I don't have to have snarkiness. Right. Um, that's not what I'm there for. Um, but I thought it was instructive that many white evangelicals will have people like me come speak at conferences and churches and what have you so that we can feel better about ourselves, but on whose terms, mm -hmm. on whose terms. And I've decided that I will not, no longer kind of come and be the person that makes everybody feel better because we had a black woman speaker. That's not the day that we're living in. We need something that will rally the church to be the church. Amen. Amen. Well said. And so how has um, your work changed since since that Facebook post? And, and really, you know, you've talked a lot about your, your um, ministry and your work changing since the 2016 election. What are some examples of, of how you've kind of shifted how you're approaching things? I think two things are in particular. One is, well, maybe even more than two. One is that I think that I'm... Um, I know my heart, I know who I am. And that's the joy of growing older, literally. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this a really, really, really long time. I became a Christian when I was 19, when I was in college at Rutgers University. Um, I've been following Jesus 
uh, by the grace of God ever since then. And um, I'm just trying to be obedient to God. So now that I'm older, I'm less um, trying to get people to like me. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> That's a <Yeah>. good thing. <laughs> so, so I'm not trying to make enemies, but I'm also not trying to go around the country making friends. I literally want to be God's person period. I, I am trying my best to live as faithfully into the call of God on my life. The second thing that's happened, because now I'm at the age where I'm not trying to win friends, approval, hope they like me, all that kind of stuff. That was that was younger. Now, now those of us who are over that that hump, we're just trying to be God's people. Right. So I'm doing that. Um, I think the second thing is I've focused uh, less on doing things to to try to be careful enough because the 2016 election, I I used to prove something to me. Let me finish that sentence. It proved to me that this was not just about the Bible because there was so much that was being said and done in the in the in by the candidate that won that um, it was clear to me that this was not biblical but Christians somehow found a way to be okay with that and that bothered me I uh, grew up in a Pentecostal church a small conservative Pentecostal church. I love it to this day. They gave me the foundations and the roots that have made me who I am. And they called us to holiness, literally called us to holiness, that to live for God was to have a certain ethic that that kind of um, d informed how we lived in the world. And they didn't make excuses for people. They either, you could be the 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 chairman of the board or the first new Christian that came in, they wanted all of us to live in a different, in a certain way in this world. And, um, and I appreciated them. They were judgmental and they were a little harsh, <laughs> but they were consistent. They meant that living for Jesus looked a certain way. And what I saw Christians do to justify hypocrisy, adultery, um, lies, immorality was confusing and painful to me. I can't speak for anybody else, but it literally devastated me. And for anybody who thinks that this was about a candidate who won, it wasn't. It was about the message that won. And that 81% of the believers of God, the followers of Christ, said that they were okay with that bothered me. So that made me come to the conclusion that we were no longer talking about Bible stuff. It wasn't being biblical enough that was actually motivating people. So I decided that I wouldn't, I would not just now hold back on telling the truth about what's happening in the world around us. Now I never have, so 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 no one will get the idea that I was just kind of tipping around things. I've been pretty strong for most of my life, and I've told the truth from for for every time that I've had the opportunity. But I decided that I wouldn't talk about things like immigration. I wouldn't talk about things that uh, that seemed to people to be a political agenda because I didn't have a political agenda. But now I know this. And I really do mean it. You can't say you love people and not care about the policies that impact those people. Mm -hmm. So now I talk much more about all of it, and it's still rooted in the Bible. Yeah, that, that you know, that's one of the, um, I think one of the, the challenges is that people have, I mean, there, there are lots of conversations going on. And here in the U.S., many of the conversations um, are, are rooted in politics, right? And, and there's division, there is um, a lot of I'm right, you're wrong type of thing, but, but there is not as much conversation being had, uh, it seems, um, from the church where the conversation is rooted in biblical values, biblical ideals. And so what, what it seems to happen is someone speaks up, someone has a voice, and rather than, than even within the church, rather than the church looking and saying, okay, what they're saying, where is that rooted in, in you know, the biblical worldview? Instead, they're automatically labeling, oh, that's either someone, you know, from this particular party or that particular party, right? It's like, that's what's kind of um, the filter that people are using. And so I guess one of my concerns is someone like you, Brenda, who is speaking out, from a very scriptural, biblically, you know, you know, biblically based place as a follower of Jesus, 
And instead of listening to your voice, they say, oh, she's she's not a big fan of our president. So dismiss. Um, so how, how do we... How do we come through that filter that so many people in the U.S. are using now that is politically biased and get down to the root of Scripture and and what the worldview looks like from God's perspective? Yeah, I think um, that's exactly what I'm calling for in Becoming Brave. I'm, I'm asking the people of God to find our courage to be who we are called to be and to know that we'll be countercultural when we do so, that there'll be people in our own families, people in our own congregations who will think that we have somehow changed or um, become whatever, whatever label will be placed on us. And it will require a certain degree of courage to do the things that I think will be required of us to be salt and light in the world today. I think one of them is we have to tell the truth just plain tell the truth. Uh, no more putting uh, all kinds of caveats on it, uh, disclaimers on it. Some things are just wrong and we know it. And in order to make them sound right, we have to do so much um, explaining. And well, if you look at it this way, I think we should just stop all that and just tell the truth because talking about your kids and my kids, they can see through that. Mm -hmm. They see the hypocrisy of it and they hear the complicity in it. So I would say to everyone listening to us, it begins with telling the truth. Let's stop making excuses and all of that. So for an example, when these children are in the street right now uh, around the world saying Black Lives Matter because they literally can and see the hypocrisy and the and the uh, difference, the disparity in how one group of people are treated by police and and how other people are treated. I can't imagine showing up at a government building with an assault rifle, at, <laughs> or anyone I know, and come out of that alive. Mm -hmm. And that's just the truth. And the church has got to look at that and know that there is a difference between a person of color with a gun in their hand and a white person with a gun in their hand. That has to be named for what it is, because if we can't tell the truth about it, we can't get free from it. And that's the goal of reconciliation, to literally be, to be transformed and become free of those things that keep us from seeing the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. So I believe we're going to have to become brave enough to tell the truth. And it begins with us telling ourselves the truth about how many of those things are things we've condoned or at least were silent in and our silence became complicit. Mm. Mm, that's that's powerful. Brenda, um, it's interesting because when we look at Scripture beginning to end, Scripture is about reconciliation. I mean, it's very, very plain. It's, it's about God reconciling humankind unto himself through Christ Jesus. So reconciliation is just like the theme of the kingdom. And, and yet it seems like Whenever we have conversations about reconciliation today, and especially right now, you know, in, in all that's going on, it seems like some people in the church push back, and they don't just come out and say this necessarily, but they push back against reconciliation and almost treat these conversations about reconciliation as if they are something that is politically motivated as opposed to something that is a part of the kingdom. How how do you respond um, to to people within the church who are kind of you know writing off these conversations as oh this is just a political agenda uh, rather than you know there is a deep issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, you and I talked before we uh, have this had this public conversation about a book that's coming out and I have no skin in the game here. His name is David Swanson and he wrote a book called Rediscipling the White Church. And anybody listening to me, I'd recommend that as well, um, because I think that it it's an issue of discipleship. 
it's an issue of the message that we were given when we became followers of Jesus Christ. So if if I could have a whiteboard, because I'm a professor as well as a preacher, and I was in front of my class, I would draw a vertical line from from top to bottom. And I would say, this is the work of reconciliation that many of us were told about when we became believers, followers of Christ, that Jesus came in the world to reconcile us back to God. True. And that is the vertical reality of the cross. But that one vertical line does not make the cross. We have been reconciled to God, but in that same death, that same act of resurrection, that same sacrifice, we also have a a horizontal line that has reconciled us to each other. So when we just preach the vertical truth of the cross, we're not preaching the cross. We're preaching the vertical reality that ends up being a stick Amen. And we <laughs> use it to bang people over the head. But without the, the horizontal, we'll never, ever talk about the full reality of the cross, that we have been reconciled to God. And in so doing, we have also been reconciled to each other. That's the gospel. And if we preach anything less than that, we're not preaching the truth of what the scriptures are teaching us, and we need to be rediscipled. Amen. We need a redo. Many of us <laughs> need to hear the gospel fresh and hear the whole thing. Because seriously, Jason, when people hear me talk about reconciliation, they wonder, what does that have to do with the Bible? And mm-hmm. I wonder, how have you followed God so long that you've never heard that? And it sounds like this is an option or an elective that people get to choose if and, if and, if and when they want to. That's, that tells me a lot about what the church has not done. Right, right. That's a good word, Brenda. Um, in your book, um, your new book, Becoming Brave, you spend quite a bit of time on Esther's story. Can you share with us what is it that we can learn about you know, social activism from Esther? I love her that story. I love the the narrative. I love the word of God. I do. And this is why literally um, we need diversity because every, every one of us has a worldview. And when we read scripture, that lens informs how we see the narrative, how we hear it. And when we bring all those perspectives together, we get a fuller picture of who God is, right? And so when I read Esther, I see a woman who uh, was of an ethnicity, an ethnic background, grew up in a single parent family. Um, I see a woman who was raised by her uncle, who taught her to, to be a devout follower of her God and who was swept up in a social, political situation of which she had, over which she had no control. And when her father figure, Mordecai, was trying to save his daughter, back to our kids, right? We try to give our kids like that last minute advice <laughs> when they're going off to college or they're getting a new job or moving out of, out of the house. And we tell them what we think would keep them safe. Mordecai tells her, don't let anybody know you're a Jew. Huh. Now, see, as a black woman, I hear the ethnic implications of that, the kinds of stuff that says, hey, if you're driving, keep your hands on the wheel if you're stopped by the police. Hey, if you're walking in a store, don't touch things. Just keep your hands to yourself. Those are the messages that parents of color tell their kids when they know the world is not going to treat them fairly. Mm-hmm. That's how Esther captured my heart. And I have watched this narrative now, even in my own life, inform what it, what it feels like when you've been trying to blend into dominant culture. And at some point, the social, political, cultural realities of your day demand you to speak up and become brave enough to speak truth to power. I think that we're in an Esther moment right now, and I believe that I wrote Becoming Brave for such a time as this. Yeah, um, right now, um, we we are witnessing these protests, you know, going on in response to horrific deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. And in, in the book of Esther, and one of the things that, that you bring up in, in your book uh, we see Mordecai showed up at the palace gates. He was in sackcloth and ashes, and Esther sent him fresh clothing at that point. 
But Mordecai refused to be comforted, and he, he refused to change his clothes. In fact, he sent the clothes back to her. And Brenda, in our present cultural moment, how can we send the clothes back? How can we truly lament what has happened or is happening in our culture? Yeah. And, and why is it important for us to do this? Great, great, great question. Thank you, Jason. What insightful questions today, and I'm grateful for the conversation. It is, and, and after I calm down a bit and just, just sit in the moment, I'm scared. We're all scared. I don't want people to dislike me. I don't want people to think ill of me. And, and um, it's easy to be tempted not to cry out a, about these things. We kind of instinctively know that the people who we will hear us outside the palace telling them to wake up and pay attention to what's happening in the world around them will feel uncomfortable with the public lament, will feel uncomfortable with the cries for justice, and will tell us it doesn't take all that. And if you would just be more patient or kinder or less, don't be so loud, you know. Uh, Mordecai, take these clothes and clean yourself up, you know, kind of tone it down. And people will do that to us. They'll they'll say, you know, I really want to support your ministry, but ah, if you keep writing things like that, posting things like that, saying things like that, I, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to send that check or you know there'll be people who leave our congregations who feel like I didn't come here for this I just came here because I enjoy being in community and I don't want to talk about these things at church there'll be subtle but very 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 clear messages that we will each receive like the guy who said we liked you better when you just quoted Bible verses it's all of the way of getting us to say maybe I should tone down maybe I shouldn't call this much attention to myself and to the issues that I'm trying to raise but that's when we'll really have to summons our courage to send the clothes back metaphorically speaking to say with tears rolling down our eyes I don't want you to leave this church I do need the grant, and I, I would love it if you would not withdraw your funding. But those are the kinds of things that will happen as we stand to speak the truth, believing that God is with us, and that's where our faith comes in, that the people who try to buy our silence in one form or the other, um, parents will save their kids. If you do that, well, we're not going to be able to pay for your college. And who wants to hear that? None of us. But I think it takes great courage to say, I love you with all my heart, mom, dad, or whomever we're speaking to, but I can't not say something about this. And so I'll have to look for a scholarship. Hmm. Yeah, it's, um, there's, there's courage that we're called to in the midst of all of this. And, um, and as you said, we will be misunderstood. Um, there will be people that take what we say, what we do um, out of context, or they'll decide that it has an agenda of its own, um, and they'll try to dismantle it by labeling it as something else. And yet we have to be courageous in following Christ um, into difficult places. So, Brenda, can you share with us a little bit about what do you see as productive ways that we as Christ followers can enter into the, the conversation of anti-racism, the conversation of reconciliation, and, and process through this in ways that honor God, um, but are also effective at helping change come to pass? Yeah, great question. Again, thank you, sir. What an interviewer you are. <laughs> I, I, I would start by saying, let's look at the Esther, Esther story. Let's use her. And that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I use her. I think she's our prototype for what to do next. And the first thing she does is call a prayer meeting. She says, we're going to fast and pray. And I am going to fast and pray with you. That's our secret weapon is to intercede, not just kind of have a prayer meeting that's us talking to God, but it's literally getting into the presence of God, using our spiritual discernment in corporate settings to hear together what God is saying to us that we must do. What is the marching orders we receive from God? I don't know how Esther left that 
uh, prayer time and goes into the king's presence knowing that she could lose her life. And her strategy is to call them to a uh, dinner. Uh, you know, I'm like, really, Esther, <laughs> dinner? <laughs> I'm sure I would have said they're going to kill everybody, but she doesn't do that. Could it be that the strategies of God are different than ours? Could it be that the word of God is right, that God's ways are not our ways? And so back to my Pentecostal upbringing, I literally believe that the resurrection is real and that God is alive and well and will speak to us if we seek God. So I would first say to everybody listening, it begins with asking God for clarity regarding what we should do. I think the second thing that I would recommend is the clarity that I've come to. I wrote another book, not trying to sell books here, but I did write a book uh, called Roadmap, Roadmap to Reconciliation 2.0. And the 2.0, almost like when you get an iPhone and you get the, you know, 6.0 and then you get the 7, not 10. <laughs> So 2.0 is because on this journey, I am learning continually too. And my first time that I wrote that book, I talked about reconciliation, literally being actively working for reconciliation, but that's very vague. I now have changed that to say that reconciliation is repairing broken systems together. Mm. It's not just saying, hey, I made friends or I helped build a house for, you know, somebody in Mexico or wherever the Philippines or wherever I went to volunteer for missions. All of that's good. I tutor kids. Great. But to literally work for reconciliation is to repair broken systems together. Let me tell you a quick story. I was listening to Brian Stevenson, um, the, the famed author of, of Just Mercy, a uh, film uh, produced in that same name, Equal Justice Initiative, the founder and director. He came uh, to speak in Seattle and someone asked him a question about reparations. And I could feel the tension in the room as soon as the word came mm -hmm. out of that guy's mouth. And Brian Stevenson said this, he said, of course I do. I believe in reparations. He said, but anybody can write a check. He said, real reparations would be to repair what was actually broken. Mm. He said, for example, African-American people were forbidden to vote in the United States of America. He said, to repair that, we would give all African-Americans the right to vote on their 18th birthday. Now that would fix what was actually broken, he said. He said, in fact, if you were an elderly African-American, we would come and pick you up and drive you to the polls. That's what reparations looks like. So to everybody listening, I think we need to get comfortable with the concept of repairing what is broken. Because in Isaiah, we were called to be repairers of the breach restorers of streets to dwell in. Amen. And so this is not a new concept. God already called us to be repairers. And I would pray that those of us who care about reconciliation would begin to do that. I love it. Such a good word, sister. Brenda, as we're wrapping up our conversation here, and I love I love that idea of, of reconciliation being driven by actually repairing broken systems together. Um, that, that it's not just something that we, we talk about or that we try to make known, you know, that there is uh, racism, that there, there are these issues, but it's actually stepping into the hard work of repairing those systems that have been broken together. Um, you are talking to your colleagues, pastors, ministry leaders. Is there anything that you would like to leave with them as we wrap up our conversation together? You know, just words of encouragement, words of challenge, whatever that might be. Yeah, I, um, I believe that leaders are going to be the key to the change that we're looking for. And I think that the generations coming behind us are looking to us to lead. And so I would say, um, I, I take a minute because I say this with great caution, but it is part of what caused me to write Becoming Brave. I have never had a vision before, but I had a vision. Um, I saw God showed me a funnel and at the funnel there said at the top listeners in the middle, it said learners. And at the tip of the funnel, it said leaders. 
And God chastised me because listeners know how to hear people like me and you all over the place. They know how to hear us on podcasts and social media, in the pulpits where we preach. Learners can read books that we write, etc. They're not as big as that listeners group, but they still get access to us. Often leaders don't know where to go to be sharpened, to become who they actually are. And God challenged me to turn it around. And so at the, as I heard God say, turn it around, that funnel turned and went on its side and became, it looked like the tip of an arrow or a spear. Hmm. And I sensed God saying this, you will pierce the darkness with the leaders at the tip of the spear. Brothers and sisters who are listening to this um, this this interview, you are at the tip of the spear. Sharpen the tip of the spear. Work to duplicate yourself and other leaders, knowing that God will multiply our impact if we would dare focus on duplicating and multiplying the leaders who are brave enough to pursue the kingdom of God. I'll leave with this one verse. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has suffered violence and they that take it, take it by force. That's the scripture I heard when I saw that tip of the spear. And I've been trying to influence leaders to be leaders ever since then. Mm, that's beautiful, Brenda. Thank you, sister, for sharing. And uh, for our listeners, we're, we'll have links to Brenda's books and to where you can connect with her on social media as well. And uh, just again, thank you for making the time to be with us. Uh, again, your voice is such an important voice in the church, and um, we so appreciate just your courageous obedience, um, that you are a brave woman, and you encourage us as, as leaders and as Christ followers, as disciples, uh, to be brave as well. So thank you so much, sister. God bless you. Thank you as well. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. We hope you are finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast, and if so, we would appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcast so they can benefit as well. Thank you in advance. And if you have any comments, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send an email to podcasts at churchleaders.com or connect with me on Twitter. You can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app, available for both Apple and Android. So be sure to check out Faith Play. Until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.